This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Steve Anderson of A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter 6. The Eclipse. In the stillness and the darkness, realization soon began to supplement knowledge. The mere knowledge of a fact is pale, but when you come to realize your fact, it takes on color. It is all the difference between hearing of a man being stabbed to the heart and seeing it done. In the stillness and the darkness, the knowledge that I was in deadly danger took to itself deeper and deeper meaning all the time. A something which was realization crept inch by inch through my veins and turned me cold. But it is a blessed provision of nature that at times like these, as soon as a man's mercury has got down to a certain point, there comes a revulsion, and he rallies. Hope springs up and cheerfulness along with it, and then he is in good shape to do something for himself, if anything can be done. When my rally came, it came with a bound. I said to myself that my eclipse would be sure to save me and make me the greatest man in the kingdom besides. And straight away my mercury went to the top of the tube, and my solicitudes all vanished. I was as happy a man as there was in the world. I was even impatient for tomorrow to come. I so wanted to gather in that great triumph and be the center of all the nation's wonder and reverence. Besides, in a business way, it would be the making of me. I knew that. Meantime, there was one thing which had got pushed into the background of my mind. That was the half-conviction that when the nature of my proposed calamity should be reported to those superstitious people, it would have such an effect that they would want to compromise. So, by and by, when I heard the footsteps coming, that thought was recalled to me, and I said to myself, as sure as anything, it's the compromise. Well, if it's good, all right, I will accept. But if it isn't, I mean to stand my ground and play my hand for all it is worth. The door opened, and some men at arms appeared. The leader said, The stake is ready. Come. The stake? The strength went out of me, and I almost fell down. It is hard to get one's breath at such a time. Such lumps come into one's throat, and such gaspings. But as soon as I could speak, I said, But this is a mistake. The execution is tomorrow. Order changed. Been set forward a day. Haste thee. I was lost. There was no help for me. I was dazed. Stupefied. I had no command over myself. I only wandered purposely about, like one out of his mind. So soldiers took hold of me and pulled me along with them, out of the cell and along the maze of underground corridors, and finally into the fierce glare of daylight and the upper world. As we stepped into the vast enclosed court of the castle, I got a shock. For the first thing I saw was the stake, standing in the center, and near it, the piled faggots, and a monk. On all four sides of the court, the seated multitudes rose rank above rank, forming sloping terraces that were rich with color. The king and the queen sat in their thrones, the most conspicuous figures there, of course. To note all this occupied but a second. The next second, Clarence had slipped from some place of concealment and was pouring news into my ear, his eyes beaming with triumph and gladness. He said, "'Tis through me the change was wrought, and main hard have I worked to do it, too. But when I revealed to them the calamity in store, and saw how mighty was the terror it did engender, then saw I also that this was the time to strike. Wherefore I diligently pretended unto this and that and the other one, that your power against the sun could not reach its full until the morrow. And so, if any would save the sun and the world, you must be slain today, where your enchantments are but in the weaving and lack potency. Odds bodikins, it was but a dull lie, 
a most indifferent invention, but you should have seen them seize it and swallow it in the frenzy of their fright, as it were salvation sent from heaven. And all the while I was laughing in my sleeve the one moment to see them so cheaply deceived and glorifying God the next that he was content to let the meanest of his creatures be his instrument to the saving of thy life. Ah, how happy has the matter sped! You will not need to do the son a real hurt. Ah, forget not that. On your soul forget it not. Only make a little darkness, only the littlest little darkness. Mind and cease with that. It will be sufficient. They will see that I spoke falsely, being ignorant, as they will fancy. And with the falling of the first shadow of that darkness, you shall see them go mad with fear. And they will set you free and make you great. Go to thy triumph now. But remember, ah, good friend, I implore thee, remember my supplication, and do the blessed son no hurt. For my sake, thy true friend. I choked out some words through my grief and misery, as much to say I would spare the son for which the lad's eye paid me back with such deep and loving gratitude that I had not the heart to tell him his good-hearted foolishness had ruined me and sent me to my death. As the soldiers assisted me across the court, the stillness was so profound that if I had been blindfolded, I should have supposed I was in a solitude instead of walled in by four thousand people. There was not a movement perceptible in those masses of humanity. They were as rigid as stone images, and as pale, and dread sat upon every countenance. This hush continued while I was being chained to the stake. It still continued while the faggots were carefully and tediously piled about my ankles, my knees, my thighs, my body. Then there was a pause, and a deeper hush, if possible, and a man knelt down at my feet with a blazing torch. The multitude strained forward, gazing, and parting slightly from their seats without knowing it, the monk raised his hands above my head and his eyes toward the blue sky, and began some words in Latin. In this attitude he droned on and on, a little while, and then stopped. I waited two or three moments, then looked up. He was standing there, petrified. With a common impulse, the multitude rose slowly up and stared into the sky. I followed their eyes as sure as guns. There was my eclipse beginning. The life went boiling through my veins. I was a new man. The rim of black spread slowly into the sun's disk. My heart beat higher and higher, and still the assemblage and the priest stared into the sky, motionless. I knew that this gaze would be turned upon me next. When it was, I was ready. I was in one of the most grand attitudes I ever struck, with my arm stretched up, pointing to the sun. It was a noble effect. You could see the shudder sweep the mass like a wave. Two shouts rang out, one close upon the heels of the other. Apply the torch! I forbid it! The one was from Merlin, the other from the king. Merlin started from his place to apply the torch himself, I judged. I said, Stay where you are. If any man moves, even the king, before I give him leave, I will blast him with thunder. I will consume him with lightnings. The multitude sank meekly into their seats, and I was just expecting they would. Merlin hesitated a moment or two, and I was on pins and needles during that little while. Then he sat down, and I took a good breath, for I knew I was master of the situation now. The king said, Be merciful, fair sir, and essay no further in this perilous matter, lest disaster follow. It was reported to us your powers could not attain unto their full strength until the morrow, but your majesty thinks the report may have been a lie. It was a lie. That made an immense effect. Up went appealing hands everywhere, and the king was assailed with a storm of supplications that I might be bought off at any price, 
and the calamity stayed. My king was eager to comply. He said, Name any terms, reverend sir, even to the having of my kingdom, but banish this calamity, spare the sun. My fortune was made. I would have taken him up in a minute, but I couldn't stop an eclipse. The thing was out of the question, so I asked time to consider. The king said, How long, uh, how long, good sir? Be merciful. Look, it groweth darker moment by moment. Pray thee, how long? Not long. Half an hour, maybe an hour. There were a thousand pathetic protests, but I couldn't shorten up any, for I couldn't remember how long a total eclipse last. I was in a puzzled condition anyway and wanted to think. Something was wrong about that eclipse, and the fact was very unsettling. If this wasn't the one I was after, how was I to tell whether this was the sixth century or nothing but a dream? Dear me, if I could only prove it was the latter, here was a glad new hope. If the boy was right about the date, and this was surely the twentieth, it wasn't the sixth century. I reached for the monk's sleeve in considerable excitement and asked him what day of the month it was. Hang him. He said it was the 21st. It made me turn cold to hear him. I begged him not to make any mistake about it, but he was sure. He knew it was the 21st. So that feather-headed boy had botched things again. The time of the day was right for the eclipse. I had seen that for myself in the beginning by the dial that was nearby. Yes, I was in King Arthur's court and I might as well make the most out of it I could. The darkness was steadily growing, the people becoming more and more distressed. Now I said, I have reflected, Sir King. For a lesson I will let this darkness proceed and spread night in the world, but whether I blot out the sun for good or restore it shall rest with you. These are the terms. To wit, you shall remain king over all your dominions, and receive all the glories and honors that belong to the kingship. But you shall appoint me your perpetual minister and executive, and give me for my services one percent of such actual increase of revenue over and above its present amount as I may succeed in creating for the state. If I can't live on that, I shan't ask anybody to give me a lift. Is it satisfactory? There was a prodigious roar of applause, and out of the midst of it the king's voice rose, saying, Away with his bonds, and set him free, and do him homage high and low, rich and poor, for he has become the king's right hand, is clothed with power and authority, and his seat is upon the highest step of the throne. Now sweep away this creeping night, and bring light and cheer again, that all the world may bless thee. But I said, that a common man should be shamed before the world is nothing. But it were dishonor to the king if any that saw his minister naked should not also see him delivered from his shame. If I might ask that my clothes be brought again, they are not meat, the king broke in, fetch raiment of another sort, clothe him like a prince. My idea worked. I wanted to keep things as they were till the eclipse was total, otherwise they would be trying again to get me to dismiss the darkness, and of course I couldn't do it. Sending for the clothes gained some delay, but not enough. So I had to make another excuse. I said it would be but natural if the king should change his mind and repent to some extent of what he had done under excitement. Therefore I would let the darkness grow a little, and if at the end of a reasonable time the king had kept his mind the same, the darkness should be dismissed. Neither the king nor anybody else was satisfied with that arrangement, but I had to stick to my point. It grew darker and darker and blacker and blacker while I struggled with those awkward sixth-century clothes. 
It got to be pitch dark at last, and the multitude groaned with horror to feel the cold, uncanny night breezes fan through the place, and see the stars come out and twinkle in the sky. At last the eclipse was total, and I was very glad of it, but everybody else was in misery, which was quite natural. I said, The king, by his silence, still stands to the terms. Then I lifted up my hands, stood just so a moment, and I said, with the most awful solemnity, Let the enchantment dissolve and pass harmless away. There was no response for a moment in that deep darkness and that graveyard hush. But when the silver rim of the sun pushed itself out a moment or two later, the assemblage broke loose with a vast shout and came pouring down like a deluge to smother me with blessings and gratitude. And Clarence was not the last of the wash, to be sure. End of chapter 6